it's Cliff here again. We're on part six of the Impact Tolerant Touch Pro, and I finally got to the bottom of what the issue was. It was a tiny little particle of foreign matter, like a speck of dirt, if you like, in the uh, electrical fluid that is uh, protecting the contact points. Um, and that's caused me to do a lot of thinking about how we are going to uh, avoid this problem in the future. You see with this touch probe it's user serviceable and the three little screws and you can pop the end cap off and you can get at the contact points should that ever be required. And the contact points are immersed in a special fluid to stop them from oxidizing and giving other issues but it's possible that from time to time a little speck of dirt will get in there or it will have been in there from the beginning and so um, the user needs to be familiar with removing the end cap, cleaning out the fluid and replacing the fluid. And um, that is only a few minutes work and uh, it should only be re required on uh, very rare occasions um, because the probe is used in this position and if we store it in this position in a wooden block, it's sealed um, from the atmosphere. When I realized the problem was a tiny particle in the electrical fluid holding the contact points open, it got me to thinking about a bit of a dilemma. These, this, this type of probe is designed to be user serviceable. It can be dismantled and uh, the fluid can be replaced so that it's a, um, a long-lasting user repairable product. Um, the high-end probes don't have that facility. They are uh, hermetically sealed and uh, I, are not user serviceable and if you have a problem it has to be sent back to the manufacturer and it's obviously very expensive to get it repaired um, but the downside of having a, a user serviceable probe um, that is open to atmosphere is that you could get a particle in there and people have to understand how to clean it clear it out and get it working again and how to stop any particles of dirt from getting in there you know by storing it in a block like that for example so you can probably see what I'm coming to here I wanted to develop a probe that was highly reliable because low end touch probes are notoriously unreliable um, but I've reached this dilemma where I realized that from time to time a particle could get between the contact points and because it's user serviceable and able to be opened and the fluid changed there's always the risk that if that isn't done correctly it could introduce a particle of dirt so I'll, I'll do a little video uh, for users for buyers explaining how to open the probe how to clean it out and how to replace the fluid should this problem ever occur as I've mentioned in other videos the Hallmark impact tolerant touch probe is uh, impact tolerant and it's much more relaxing to use you can jog up to your part and just quickly come in you're not too concerned about crashing it um, within the range of its retraction zone you can crash in vertically and sideways um, without breaking the stylus uh, it's not a fragile self-sacrificing stylus and so uh, there's benefits that come from that One of the benefits of that is that because the stylus is rigid and strong, it's not self-sacrificing, therefore it flexes much less and it's inherently a lot more accurate. And as long as you're within the range of its retraction zone, you won't damage the probe. Of course the main practical function of a touch probe is the ability to quickly find the work offset position, the uh, cutter or spindle center line position to your job. And uh, we can use the probing routines of Pathpilot and Mac 3 and quickly find the uh, center of your job or the edge of your job or the center of a hole or a boss and so on. Let's just do a simple probing routine. routine. <laughs> And we find the X, Y coordinates and they're set 
automatically on the DROs and we do a similar routine for the Z. That's what a touch probe will do, but uh, what about what it won't do? I mean, what are reasonable expectations to have with this technology? And let's, first of all, let's, let's remember this is low-cost probing technology. If you want a high-end uh, Renishaw or Heidenheim probe, you can pay five, ten, fifteen thousand US dollars for the full kit for the software and the tool setter and so on. So that's a completely different world. And it's designed for vertical machining centers um, that are many thousands of dollars in expense. What we're really talking about here is an automated edge finding device. And, and, and I'm underlying that fact because I've had quite a few emails from viewers with very high expectations of a low-end probe. Um, Tomac, uh, I give them credit, they're very honest and open about this. They say that their low-end touch probe is uh, suitable for occasional use for hobby applications and that you'll get corrosion on the contact points and you need to re relatively often uh, polish them to, to keep the probe working again. They've been honest and open about it and I want to be honest and open about what the Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Probe can and can't do. Okay, so let's talk about accuracy. A high-end probe, you can work to within a micron, that's a thousandth of a millimeter. A low-end probe probably won't admit to what their accuracy is or isn't, but you might have seen my series of tests that I did about a year ago on the Tourmark um, Passive Touch Probe, and it has uh, pre-travel variation of between uh, five hundredths of a millimeter and 0.11 of a millimeter. That's about six hundredths of a millimeter variation between one position and another. And that is uh, 60 microns, 60 times less accurate. And that's the sort of reality of a low cost touch probe. So we need to keep that in mind. Now the Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Probe is much more accurate than that, but it still has a pre-travel variation of two to three hundredths of a millimeter. That's about a thou. So that means that you can set your part up to within about a thou, which is good enough for most workshop situations. Okay, so still on the subject of accuracy, remember if you've got a typical low-end machine like a Tourmac, it's got an R8 spindle bore um, and you're using TTS, there's uh, not a lot of accuracy there. By the time you combine all the various uh, R8 and ER20 collets and all of the variable runouts between them, you'll be lucky to have your cutter running true within a thou. Um, you really, your, your backlash on your typical low-end machine is around a thou. So there's no point in having a low-end machine that is really only repeatable to within one or two thou and then having a high-end probe that's good to a micron. We need to be realistic about our accuracy. You can greatly improve the potential of TTS by having a mark on your pulleys, on your pulley so that it is always in the same position. Have your probe set at the front um, so it's always in the same position and then when you calibrate it it's correct in that orientation and that takes away a lot of the variables of the uh, inaccurate TTS system. But um, still, you've got to be practical about accuracy. And I think going off some of the emails I've received, people are, are hoping to work within microns on their low-end machine, whereas in reality, the backlash and the spindle um, repeatability um, and the, and the low-cost probes means you, you just can't work to those sort of accuracies. I think the best solution is to supply the probe um, without any fluid in it and have a, uh, a non-publicly uh, available YouTube video explaining how to pull the end cap off, install the uh, fluid which would be supplied with the probe, be in a little syringe or tube, uh, it should only take a few minutes to clean it out, put the fluid in and that way if the problem ever occurs in the future uh, then it can be dismantled and uh, cleaned out and the fluid replaced and then it will be well again. So I think that's the, the most practical way forward uh, with this potential problem.
Well, it's all very well talking about accuracy in theory, but let's just uh, use an actual job as an example. So here I'm doing my tool making work. I'm cutting um, some cavities in a mould, and in an existing mould, this is a pre-hardened uh, P20 steel precision die set, and I've cut a cavity in one half and a, a cavity in the other half, and it has to be uh, central so the position is very critical. So I'll just go through how I set that and what the results were. Okay, so let's just go through using the probe. So we uh, set the Y work offset in the uh, middle of the precision ground mold set. It's a 150.1 millimeter ground mold set and uh, we're just finding the center of the uh, mold set in the Y. Just using a path pilot's rectangular circular probing routine page. Now we can find the uh, and set the X. Hopefully you can see this. Automatically probes and finds the X position. Now we have the center of the block accurately set. So that was the procedure I used to find the center of the block and then I machined out this cavity so now we can just measure it uh, quite easily and accurately uh, just to see how central it actually is in the real world. So we're getting 57... got to hold the mic really square and about the same depth down. We're getting 576... Five, five. We come to the other side. Just rattle it into its home. The beginning. Five seven six five two approximately. So you can see we are central within three microns. So that's really good. That's a third of a hundredth of a millimeter, or one or two tenths of a thou. So. In a real world situation, it's done the job brilliantly for me. Well, while that was a remarkably good result of a practical test of, of the accuracy of the setup, um, you have to keep it in mind that uh, the variables with the TTS and the uh, probe calibration and the uh, backlash and the X, Y, and Z of the machine, you know, the loss motion between the direction change. Um, and the pre-travel uh, variations of the tri-swing arm inside the probe, they could have all conspired, well, well they probably all conspired in this case to cancel each other out virtually, uh, but they could equally have all conspired to produce a bigger error. Okay, so I've talked about what the probe can do and what it can't do, um, that it's designed to be long-lasting, uh, have a long life and be user-serviceable. Um, gone over that. Um, I've tested it I think as much as I need to now in-house. I've got to the point now where I'm not finding any more issues or faults. It seems really rock solid and so I have started to ship them out to early adopters. Um, the, the first phase has been sent out and I'm getting um, good feedback from people. I haven't struck any problems yet. So uh, I've been holding off on finishing this video um, until I got to that point. So when I first uh, did some videos on this uh, impact tolerant touch probe I started to receive emails and feedback and support and encouragement from you viewers and I really appreciate that. It's really helped motivate me and keep me going to know that this is a group of people who are enthusiastic about the idea and would like one. That really helps you to develop something and keep going with it. So thank you for that. Um, been most appreciated. I've kept a list of emails of people who would be interested in a touch probe and I've got that um, stored away safely. So if you've sent me an email, rest assured I haven't forgotten you. So I'm contacting folk from the list of uh, early emails that have shown an interest in the probe um, and uh, out of respect for them trying to do it in chronological order um, of date of sending the email but of course it isn't quite that simple because I have to also um, 
make sure that they are logistically suitable. I want to cover off tour Mac owners with Pathpilot and TTS and folk that are going to be using it regularly and so on. Um, so if I haven't contacted you, rest assured I haven't forgotten you. Um, I will contact you sooner or later. Really appreciate uh, the support you've given me and, and um, I want to honour that. Um, but I, I may not be contacting you as soon as you'd like. I'm sorry, this is a long-winded process. But many thanks for your support. Um, and uh, if uh, you're not on that list, if you haven't already emailed me, feel free to send me one anytime. This is an interesting stage now. We're moving into production and sales. And it strikes me that there's uh, a little bit of uh, conflict about the philosophy of where to how to move ahead from this this position um, from a purely commercial business point of view a lot of advisors would say that you need to ramp it up quickly and get the sales out there and get really established with the product before some dreaded competition comes along um, but from a, a product development and long-term quality point of view you want to ramp it up really slowly because you want this product to last for years and if any problem is identified, you, you want to catch it early and sort it out early before it becomes too complicated. And so um, that, that is in a little bit in conflict with the business model. Because I think in the long run, um, a product like this must be good quality and, and, long -term, and good, have good long-term reliability if it's going to be a successful product anyway. Because we're not selling a fashion item here, we're selling a highly technical product to a group of uh, top discerning technical people, CNC machinists, um, and, uh, are uh, a pretty astute bunch of people. And so I think in this case, it's, it is justifiable, even from a commercial point of view, to um, be really thorough with the R&D stage and, and um, not get too carried away about the scale of the business. So I'm going to stay with just this gradual ramping up of production. So the plan is to put together a few more and ship a few more out to you early adopters that I have on the list. Um, and if uh, you haven't contacted me already and you would be interested in an Impact Tolerant Touch Pro, then uh, please feel free to email me cliffhalldesign at gmail.com um, and it would be really good to have a list to help me with establishing the size of the next production run I'll probably wait uh, a little while um, just to make sure that there isn't any hiccups at all out there and then uh, in a few weeks time or perhaps a few months time I will uh, do a bigger production run of parts and, um, and assembly and begin to ship more out. Alright so thanks for your patience and thanks once again for watching.